there was black corrosive mold everywhere in people's apartments. And we need capital money to fix these apartments immediately. The city budget, as you know, has grown by over 20% over the last few years. So it's important to note that we need to take a more sober approach as far as saving for a rainy day. We can't predict with 100% certainty what's ahead in Washington, D.C. or in Albany, but we can set aside money for the worst. And so this council is requesting the city place more money in our cash reserves, and we are calling for $500 million in additional funds for our reserves afford to let New York slide back into insolvency and putting more in our reserves will help prevent that. Uh, taken together, I think this is a responsible budget plan with focused spending measures offset by identified resource savings, uh, resource so re revenue sources, savings, and agency efficiencies and reductions. I really, really want to thank our finance chair, uh, Councilmember Danny Drum, who did an impeccable job uh, throughout this process, leading the budget negotiating team. I want to thank the chair of our subcommittee on the capital plan, Vanessa Gibson, and we can talk a little bit about capital, uh, which we are approaching in a very different way, and you'll see that as part of our response, and she has taken the lead on that. And every member here who participated in a real way in this budget response, if you go through the packet that we handed out, we go agency by agency, we look at the broad uh, tax forecast, revenue forecast for the entire city. And I believe this is a pretty aggressive response uh, to what was presented to us. And we expect uh, a real negotiation uh, from now into the executive budget. And we hope that many of these things are included in the mayor's executive budget. And then from our executive budget hearings into adoption where the council will negotiate as a whole. I want to thank the incredible finance staff who have been working around the clock, led by our finance director, Tanya McKinney, who we are really grateful for. All of the division heads all the members of the finance division who all have really, really supported us. Um, so with that, I am happy to take uh, any questions that you all So I want to, I'll give you some, some quick uh, facts on the, on the property tax uh, rebate. So it would be um, $400 and the cost is about $167 million uh, total. It would affect 467 property tax rebate because they make under $150,000 and it's their primary residence. Um, the, in, since 2010, the median tax bill for one to three family homes, uh, class one, has gone up more than twice the rate of their incomes. And taxes are up an average of 5.9% a year, but incomes are only up 2.3% a year. Uh, rents have even not gone up that fast because uh, Rent Guidelines Board have been pretty low and we've seen the market stabilize a little bit as it comes to rent increases. So we think that this is a short-term measure to provide some property tax relief while we set up a property tax commission with the mayor and go to Albany in the next legislative session asking for structural changes in our property tax system. Our property tax system is broken. This does not fix that, but it shows that we are thinking about the needs of homeowners who have seen their assessments and property taxes uh, increase at rates that are almost double what their income has increased. So it's a way to provide uh, some relief. So on the, on the kind of the broader uh, financial plan, um, you know, there have been some pretty significant unfunded mandates that have been passed down to us um, from the state. Uh, we got $200 million, that unfunded mandate for implementation of Raise the Age, $31 million on Close to Home, $418 million on the Subway Action Plan, and potentially, uh, more money as it relates to charter schools that come in as part of uh, the risk to us as well. 
But if you look through the, the response, we believe with an updated tax revenue forecast, there's an additional $1.2 billion uh, that is going to come in. $650 million is right-sizing the property tax reserve to reflect historic delinquencies and people paying their property taxes. We think when we look at re-estimates, whether it be parking fine revenues, um, we think that there's going to be $135 million in additional re-estimates when we look at the revenue that the city is calculating. The council does its own revenue forecast, re-estimate forecast, separate from OMB. OMB's forecast is low. Uh, IBO's forecast is slightly higher. It's like Goldilocks. They're a little too cold. IBO's a little too hot, and we're somewhere in between. Um, and we think that this is actually a, a, a reasonable thing. We think there's going to be $110 million as a surplus at the end of the year, which will be part of the roll. Part of that is 2,200 um, vacant headcount slots, agency by agency, that haven't been filled by the administration. We don't think they should fill most of those slots. And we think there's $110 million that come savings that way plus fringe benefits that would be part of that. There's $141 million in uh, debt cost savings when we refinance the debt in the city. Uh, we think that OMB has unrealistic assumptions on interest rates and the variable rate debt. We think there's $142 million in agency efficiencies. And um, so that adds up to uh, about $400 million um, on just the agency side. And then when you add in the role, you add in the property tax, you get to a number where we are actually um, calling for less than what OMB says our final budget would be. Is it 187 for property tax? Yeah. 187. 187. 187. I apologize. <laughs> Henry's playing Scott Stringer in the inner circle, so he'll know. <laughs> Henry, go ahead. I have a question about that, which is, what's the rationale for giving individual families four hundred dollars and removing a hundred and eighty million dollars of operating money, expense money that you could use for all kinds of maybe expenses that the city has? I mean, it's like giving a million people a package of bubble gum. So I think if you, and I'm sure you all will, ask the council members here um, after this press conference about the budget response, if you ask them how many of you have heard from homeowners in your districts about ballooning assessments and uh, property taxes that have gone through the roof, I think nearly everyone here would raise their hand. We wish that we had more authority on fixing some of the structural problems as it relates to our property tax system as a whole on how assessments are categorized and how we could change those things. But we don't. We ultimately need state authorization. So we think it's a good faith measure to show uh, primary homeowners that we want to provide them some short-term relief while we put together a property tax commission with some long-term solutions and then go to the state legislature and the governor next year. Are there ways that we could potentially spend this $187 million? There are $188 million. Are there ways that we could spend this $188 million? Uh, yes. But we also are, I think, being fiscally responsible and calling for $500 million in reserves, significant uh, agency reductions. We are calling for a total overhaul in how DHS is spending their money and putting more money into supportive housing. We're calling for a repurposing of Department of Education funds and putting $250 million in uh, DOE funds this year and increasing fair student funding, which goes directly to city schools. So. We're looking at this in a holistic way, not piece by piece. The city's budget has grown drastically since Mayor de Blasio took office. It went from, I believe, 71 billion, and it's now up to 88 billion. Last year it was 86 billion. So we could always spend money in different ways. This is us trying to provide some short-term property tax relief to people who have seen their assessments go through the roof. It helps them with their tax bill. $400 yes. Mm -hmm. 
You know, I, uh, you know, there are plenty of members here who, who could, who, there, there are members here who could, who could speak on this, who represent districts that have a lot of single multifamily homeowners, uh, co-ops and condos uh, in large buildings, who will tell you that, who uh, would complain in saying that many of the items that we spend money on, their neighborhoods end up not feeling. And I don't know if that's actually true. I think there are plenty of things that neighborhoods all across the city feel, but I think this is a gesture for us to show that we know our property tax system is broken and we want to help them in the short term on their assessments. Josh? Um, Speaker, can you talk about the MTA, why they're not going to be on the hook for this fair fare? Why should the city, where our, our, what we pay to the state is already uh, far more than what other counties pay? Well, as we know, the MTA is in a pretty dire financial place as it relates to their capital needs. And uh, the state mandated on us the subway action plan, half of it of $418 million, which goes to things that are very important, track repair work, signal repair work, water getting into the subways, hiring more maintenance workers. Those are all good things. They're not the sexiest items, but they are things that hopefully will stabilize the subway system for strap hangers in the short term. This is not us subsidizing the MTA. This is us helping low-income New Yorkers. There's a difference between the two. This is us saying that if you are someone who is struggling, if you're a family of four making under $24,000 a year as defined by the poverty limit, you can't really lead a stable life if you can't afford subway fares. And we also believe this will help with fare evasion, that a lot of people who, not all, but a lot of people who end up jumping a turnstile are people who can't afford uh, the subway fare. So we think this will help in a criminal justice related way. It will help people in poverty. And uh, this is not subsidizing the MTA, it's helping low income New Yorkers. If we have a 22nd century subway system that is funded adequately by the city and by the state, and hopefully at some point real federal dollars, maybe we won't need to do this. But I think that in the short term, I don't see this turning around anytime soon. And this would be something that I would feel confident in the city making the investment in every single year. There's one thing I didn't mention in here, it's in the budget response. This is not just fair fares for people living in poverty. We also have, uh, we include a certain number of veterans who are here on the GI Bill, um, and we give a gesture to them as well uh, to help them with fair fares as well. So it's low-income New Yorkers and a certain per, a, a portion of veterans living in New York City. Jill? Um, I'm open to that. I haven't had that conversation with him. There was a 1993 commission that was put together by Mayor Dinkins and former Speaker uh, Vallone. That commission was a joint commission by the mayor and the council. There were ex officio members. The finance commissioner was an ex officio member and the finance director in the city council, who I should know who it was, but I don't yet uh, at that time. Mark Shaw, it was Mark Shaw. Mark Shaw was an ex officio member of that commission. So we want to look at the 1993 model, which is a joint commission um, that both sides are able to participate in a full way. I mean, I hope we don't have to do legislation. I hope the mayor will agree to do this with us, but we're open to doing it. And we think the commission needs to be um, a relationship between both of us because the other side of city hall can't do anything on property taxes without us as a council. Yes. Are you concerned that an overhaul could lead to a lot of single family homeowners ending up paying more? So the structural problems are so deep from when our current property was created. property tax equity that we don't have the solution. That's why
want to get put together a commission of experts to come up with the fairest way to do it. And I think one of the touchstones that the mayor's used in talking about this is ensuring that it remain revenue neutral, that we don't see a big hit to the city's finances, which means we may not be able to make it as equal as we'd like, but it is so unequal right now. We need to, we need to make it more fair, and we hope that's not just on the margins. Gloria? Yep. The mayor has already said just now in his press conference that he doesn't think the city should pay for it. So is the council willing to pay for all of it if, you, if you're unable to reach a deal with him on it? And, and, and I have another question. This is going to be one of the major parts of our negotiation. and. The mayor, when he ran for count, when he ran for mayor in 2013, he talked about a tale of two cities. For folks that can't afford the subway every single day, I think that shows the type of city that they're living in. The mayor is ideologically a left of center progressive, and I think this issue should be in his wheelhouse. This aligns with many other policies that he's talked about in making our city a more fair, just, and equal city, especially for those who are struggling to make ends meet. And so this will be a major part of our negotiations uh, with uh, our finance director, Latanya McKinney, our finance chair, uh, Chair Drum, myself, OMB, the mayor, as we move forward. This is going to be one of the pillars of our negotiations. And if I could just ask you another question. Yeah. So there's about uh, $485 million in uh, known unfunded mandates, which we had no say in, that were passed along to us through the state budget. The major areas, again, raise the age close to home and the subway action plan. The new programs that we are asking for, um, and I don't know if you count this as a program, but $500 million in reserves, $187 million in a $400 property tax rebate, and $212 million in fair fares. Those are kind of three of our pillars in this budget response. Fair fares for low-income New Yorkers, property tax rebate for middle-class New Yorkers, and reserves to show fiscal prudence moving forward in uncertain times. And then when we go agency by agency, we're calling for uh, $227 million in a combination of new spending uh, and baselining of funds um, in areas. When we go adjusting the available resources and what OMB gave us by $1.8 billion. Is Ray here? $1.8 billion. We, we believe that, that our forecast, again, in between what IBO is saying and what OMB is saying, we think there's $1.8 billion. And when we go through the list, re-estimates $135 million. Updated tax revenue forecast, $1.2 billion. So we're not just spending a lot of money, we're also cutting back on savings in certain agencies, especially DHS. Yeah? Have you, as the, this first phase of the budget process goes on, have you, I haven't heard a lot of discussion in the hearings about PEGs or asking agencies to, to I know the mayor has asked the agencies to come up with savings, but as the council has I would be open to a peg. I think, and, and, not, and not just for doing it, doing it for doing its sake. I think it's a good exercise for an agency, each agency, annually to go through what they're spending money on to understand areas where there could be potential savings so that when a downturn comes, when there's a huge loss in federal funds, when there's a big loss in state funds, when there's $485 million in unfunded mandates and we need to come up with money, every agency should use their own muscle memory every year of understanding where they can save potential money. The mayor said in his preliminary budget response, correct me if I'm wrong, Latanya, uh, that he was finding $900 million in savings across agencies. That's not through what he traditionally calls a peg, but I would be open to a peg agency by agency, even if they don't institute it, just to understand where potential savings is. Jacob? Yes. 
Yes. Uh, it is. We believe in this, and the council's done this for a while. Councilmember Levin, do you want to talk a little bit um, about the Priority 5 vouchers and why we put it in the sure. response? So uh, when uh, this administration started, uh, there was a certain number of Priority 5 vouchers. As, as children attrit out at, at age 13, that number continues to go down. So when the administration added um, what are called the SCCF vouchers, which is uh, a new voucher that is taking the place of those, uh, priority fives, as that number continues to go down with attrition, the SCCF allocation has to increase in order to stay the same um, in terms of the, the number of vouchers that, that were there, um, you know, back in the beginning of this administration and, and the, the last council. And um, another question. Sure. Uh, last year, the council So uh, Councilmember Levine took a real lead on this when he chaired uh, the Jewish caucus uh, last term and asking for more money, I believe. Uh, Councilmember Levine, you want to talk about, if you want to come up and talk about this, about increasing the NYPD's hate crime unit and looking at security at religious institutions and schools across the city. So um, Councilmember Levine, if you want to talk about what we've done so far. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And this was a, a priority of, of the council in the last term. Uh, as a response to increasing threats against Jewish institutions, not just Jewish people in the city. Um, the current law, as you know, has a threshold of 300 students uh, per yeshiva uh, or Catholic school or Muslim school, any non-public institution. Um, there are uh, cases where you've got multiple schools in one building that don't qualify because each of them is less than uh, the threshold and there's schools which, though they're standalone, don't meet the threshold. So advocates have talked about um, lowering the threshold so that more institutions can benefit from this. Uh, that's something that we're in conversation with school leaders and advocates about um, as, a, as a version 2.0 of this legislation. It's not in the budget response. It's an ongoing conversation. Absolutely. Thank you. Right. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Yep. Um, Yes. In 2015, we had one. If they want a modification, they have to come to the city council. And we're not a rubber stamp. We have oversight questions. We have questions that need to be answered, and I want to let Councilmember Drum talk a little bit um, about this morning's hearing and the questions. As I said to you earlier this morning, it's a new council, it's a new situation. We have new expectations, and we expect the administration to live up to those expectations. Plain and simple. Um, so our proposal, the funding of our proposal is totally aligned with what the Writers Alliance and the Community Service Society have called for in their position paper over the last couple of years. Um, you know, there will be, of course, a system in place that we're going to have to negotiate if we get this funded, uh, when we get this funded, with the MTA um, on how to create eligibility. It could be through HRA. We could come up with some ideas on agencies that currently do a good job at doing income verification. We're open to that. We want to make it easy for New Yorkers to actually qualify, get the benefits, and see it where it's not an onerous pro so It has to be a real process of income verification, but not an onerous process so it can actually get to them. And what was the first part of your question, Noah? What's the eligibility? Is it it's, yeah. 
Yes, it's on the federal poverty limit. Um, so for a family of four, I believe the number is just under $25,000. I think it's $24,900, something like that. So there are, um, if you look at the, the CSS proposal, it goes through person by person, family size by family size on income eligibility. Yoav. Jen, could I have a copy of the response for a second? Sorry, I didn't hear you, Leo. I apologize. What'd you say? Yeah, hold on. Let me get to the sheet of paper. Um, page five. Um, we are. Yeah, Ray. That's a, that's a technical thing. The size of the budget is determined by the size of the revenue budget. That's what we just did in the mod. When we, when we talk about the financial mod, the mod budget modification, um, and then seven increasing the budget, it's the size of the revenue budget. So that is the extra amount of revenue that we're adding. We're not actually spending any of that this year. We're actually going to put that money aside, roll it into next year, and that will support both the increase in reserves, the spending and the unfunded mandate, and the unfunded mandate. So it's not a it's not extra spending, it's an increase in the size of the budget the way that the budget is the good Dr. Ray Majeski, our chief economist here at the City Council. <laughs> Doctor's orders, Yoav. <laughs> so we we call for a repurposing of uh, a significant amount of his spending. One of the major things, uh, Sally's not here, though she wouldn't be the only one interested in this, but I think she would be interested in this. We're calling for some significant changes on supportive housing. So right now, um, you know, at uh, Chair Levin's hearing on the budget, Commissioner Banks said they were only able to bring online 150 units of supportive housing when they were on, they were supposed to get 550 units of supportive housing by the end of uh, 2017. Two and a half years ago, the mayor called for a 15 year plan for 15,000 units of supportive housing. The way to solve the homelessness crisis in New York City, there are many prongs to it. Councilmember Levine had the right to counsel bill, which has made a tremendous uh, difference so far. We've already seen that. But the best thing we can spend money on right now is supportive housing instead of shelters. Instead of managing homelessness, we should be reducing homelessness, as Councilmember Reynoso said at the hearing. That was his line, not mine. We're also calling for um, uh, how we use rental assistance vouchers differently. The vouchers that have been the most successful so far are the city FEPS vouchers, Family Emergency Program Supplement. And there's no timeline on using those rental assistance vouchers. The link vouchers, all the link vouchers have a, have a time limit on them, which has made it difficult on the uptake for landlords who want to participate in that program. So we think they should be flexible on the rental assistance vouchers, repurpose money for supportive housing away from 90 sited permanent shelters, and we have some other things in our DHS section that we call upon. Yes. I can't say we want to prove it. There's, everything's a negotiation, and I think you saw at the, I haven't been briefed on it yet, um, but I think you saw, and Chair Drum can talk to you about this separately, or he may have already, you saw some pushback this morning at the Finance Committee hearing on the modification, some concerns about spending, and so we're going to continue to talk. I can take. I was wrong, it is 180. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> uh, That's the way it is. Mr. Com Mr. Controller, thank you. <laughs> yes, sir. Well, 
We think we have to be fiscally prudent and restrained. That's why we're calling for $500 million in reserves. Last year, the council called on $500 million in reserves, ended up being $300 million. In this preliminary budget, they called for no reserves. What was your sense of the growth of recent years? Well, the growth so shows, I think, some good things for the city. It shows that our economic activity um, is doing well. Unemployment is at an all-time low since before the Great Recession. If you look at the jobs report at the federal and state level every single month, we've been creating jobs. We've been paying uh, the best paying jobs, which is part of the problem. Tourism is at an all-time high. Um, and our budget's grown from $86 billion last year to $88 billion. But as we all talk about in the budget hearings, when you dig deeper into the numbers, 63,000 people in DHS shelters last night, thousands of women in HRA domestic, homeless, domestic violence shelters, uh, thousands of runaway homeless youth in shelters, 5,000 unsheltered people living on the streets of New York City, 22% of New Yorkers living in poverty, uh, below the poverty line, when you go up to the poverty line, it jumps to 43%. Four in 10 New Yorkers, when you walk around New York City, are living at the poverty line. And so even though our economy is doing well in some sectors, even though unemployment's low, even though the budget is growing, New Yorkers who are low income, New Yorkers who are working multiple jobs, New Yorkers who have seen their wages remain stagnant or go down, New Yorkers have seen their hours cut back, New Yorkers who are underemployed have not felt the feeling of that $88 billion. And so that's why we make the gesture on fair fares, that's why we make the gesture on property tax relief, and that's why we make the gesture on reserves hitting three major areas, low-income New Yorkers, middle-class New Yorkers, and reserves for difficult times ahead. Last question, Yoav. I sure hope not, Yoav. <laughs> I sure hope not. Is, is it in response to the fact that his commission is taking so long to get up and running, or are you just trying to ensure that you guys have a say? Speaker Mark Viverito called for this in her first uh, budget when she was elected. She put money in the budget at that time. I wasn't part of the conversation. I wasn't on the budget negotiating team or in leadership, so I don't know how it fully worked itself out. Uh, but um, this is not a new idea from my part. Speaker Mark Viverito and Chair Ferreras Copeland uh, talked about this when uh, Chair Ferreras Copeland chaired the Finance Committee and the Speaker was the Speaker. Um, so this is not a new idea, and we want to be equal partners in the Property Tax Commission. I want to just highlight one final thing, which Brendan Cheney is not here, but he would love this, um, and I think it's really important because it shows how we're doing things differently. If you go to page 49 in the, in the book and you look at... Um, all of these lines that you see, line by line by line, you'll see 123 different new areas for units of appropriation that the council is calling for, for greater transparency on the expense side of the budget. We went through agency by agency, looking line item by line item, looking by dollar amount and saying, we need more information, we need more transparency, we need more accountability to show New Yorkers how your tax dollars are being spent. We did the same thing on the capital side. Part of the reason why, and Chair Amprey Samuel is the one who asked for this in the budget response, so she deserves an enormous amount of credit, the $2.4 billion in new capital funds for NYCHA over a four-year plan. Right now, the amount that's appropriated in our city's capital budget, it's about $79 billion over the four-year capital plan, Nathan? $79 billion over the four-year capital plan. What we see in that is the year-to-year -year commitments versus what's been appropriated. What's being, what is actually being spent is 50% what's appropriated every year. So we're only spending, Vanessa, Vanessa knows this. She spent a lot of time on this. Um, we are only spending half of what's in our capital commitment. At any time, ONB could repurpose those funds. Mm -hmm. And we are saying repurpose the excess appropriations that you have right now for NYCHA, for mold remediation, for heat and hot water systems, for senior affordable housing on NYCHA properties across the city, the Metro IAF East Brooklyn Congregation Plan. That's what we're calling for in the capital budget. So the units of appropriation here show what we're asking for from a transparency perspective, 
And Vanessa, do you want to talk just for a moment about um, the capital budget and transparency? Sure, sure. Good afternoon, everyone. And I am grateful for the leadership of our speaker, Corey Johnson, and our finance chair, Danny Drum, and to all of my colleagues. And what you see now in this new tenure here at the City Council is really our deliberate effort to refocus on capital, something that has really not been done for quite some time. And what we recognize in the preliminary budget process that we had last month is many of our agencies have very low commitment rates. They are front loading all of their their dollars in year one, assuming that they're going to begin many of these capital projects in year one when we know that's not realistic. The excess appropriations that Speaker Johnson talked about, we want to make sure that we draw down on that excess and really make sure that every agency is spending the money. What we've also looked at is how we can provide creative approaches to expanding on our bidding process and opening up the opportunity for MWBE firms that have never had an opportunity to compete on any of these projects to build and support projects in our city. We've also looked at contingency budgets to make sure that we're really holding the line on a lot of our agencies. We've also looked very deliberately at many agencies capital team. What does the design team look like, the architects, as we move from design to procurement to groundbreaking to construction? So we've been very deliberate in what we're doing because we have to be held accountable to the public. Why does it take so long to rebuild and, and construct parks and comfort stations and major capital items like libraries and schools and parks and playgrounds? And so this subcommittee has really done an incredible amount of work in a very short time to make sure that we put our priorities forth and in the budget response you will see a lot of our recommendations on how we believe we can achieve improved efficiency and make sure that these projects are on time and on budget while we remain in office we want these projects completed so we can reduce redundancy and in consistency. So I'm looking forward to the conversations over the next several weeks as we put together and continue to talk about our priorities as it relates to the capital budget. Thank you. And the one final point I would make on the reserves, as um, uh, Councilman Rosenthal just uh, aptly and rightly pointed out to me, is that these are general principles that um, fiscal experts call upon when the budget grows to have an increase in reserves. So we're operating on what the Citizens Budget Commission uh, has recommended, what the Independent Budget Office has recommended, mm -hmm. what the Comptroller's Office, both the City and State Comptroller's Office has recommended. Uh, OMB put zero dollars uh, proposed for reserves. We're calling for $500 million. Thank you all very much. Yeah. 